Welcome to NinjaCast, a photography podcast powered by Studio Ninja, the world's highest rated business management app built specifically for photographers. Listen and learn as the most successful photographers on the planet share their knowledge to help you transform every element of your photography business. Here's your host, Sally Shaw. Hi guys, welcome to yet another episode of NinjaCast. Today is a little bit of a special one. We have the founders of Studio Ninja joining us, Chris and Ewan. Now we're gonna be covering everything from how Studio Ninja was founded, right through to their brand new book, Shoot Like a Ninja, with some definite top tips in there for streamlining your business. Let's get started. Hi Chris, hi Ewan, how are you? Very well, Sally. Nice to see you again. I, um, I hope you know your job is on the line today based on how you interview us. So I want only nice questions and only um, keep it simple. Otherwise, you're in big trouble. Just keep it just for the record, just letting you know. <laughs> no pressure. So let's move on to you, in because you're not my friend anymore. <laughs> yeah, we only, we only take political correct <laughs> questions in this interview. Well, Nothing else. Fingers crossed we've got it right then, hey? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I'm joking. You can ask anything. You can First ask all, anything. Thank you both so much for coming on the show. Um, obviously, this is Studio Ninja podcast, but we have never interviewed you guys, and I'm sure our listeners are really excited to learn more about the people behind the brand. So thank you again. Um, Chris, if we start with you, I mean, can you tell our listeners a little bit about your journey you know, let's go back before Studio Ninja. What did you do? How did it lead to Studio Ninja? Hmm. All right. So let's go back about 15 years where it all sort of began. Um, so I finished university with a multimedia design degree. So I was always in the creative areas. Um, from there, I got a job as, well, at uni, I thought I, I just loved like 3D and 3D animation. And throughout uni, I was just like daydreaming and working really hard, thinking I wanted to be a 3D animator. That's what I just like desperately, I just loved it. I don't know why I was just, just in the zone and that's all I wanted to do. So when I finished uni, I actually um, got a little internship with a little 3D studio. And they quickly, I guess like working for those guys, they were giving me tasks and giving me little jobs to do. And I quickly realized uh, that job wasn't all I thought it was going to be. Like at, at the end of the day, I would have just been sitting in a cubicle working 10 hours a day, animating grass or like, like, like it just, it just all the excitement. I mean, I'm sure it'd be amazing to animate Shrek or whatever, but once I learned the processes, it just became a bit mundane and repetitive. And I just kind of lost interest pretty quickly. And then I got a job as a retoucher. I was um, living with a friend of mine who was working for a wedding photography studio who she was doing all of their album designs. And I heard that they were um, a little bit behind in their post-production. So I gave the boss a call. I'm like, hey, you know, I've, I've, I've got a degree. I know how to use Photoshop. If you guys need any help at all with your retouching or post-production, just give me a yell or flick me some work and I'll, I'll show you what I can do. And I think they were actually quite desperately needing help and they were really far behind in their post-production. So um, the boss gave me a call. He's like, you know what, Chris, let's, here's a few albums to retouch. Let's see how you go. So I worked from home, just um, doing a few of those. And he was happy with my work. So he's like, Chris, how about you come into the studio and start working for us? I was like, yes, my first job. I'm so excited. <laughs> first thing out of uni. And it was actually really fun. Um, you know, I spent about six months just like retouching full time, really. And I, I didn't know anything about photography. I didn't know anything about the industry. Um, it was sort of my first foot in the door. And I don't know if it's my personality or a Gemini thing or, or something, but after six months, I was starting to get a bit bored. And, um, but I was like, wow, these photos are beautiful. I mean, the retouching is getting a bit monotonous, but the photography is stunning. So I had a few beers with my boss. I'm like, oh, man, can you teach me how to be a photographer? And he's like, what? I'm like, oh, can I come, you know, can I hang out with you after hours or come along to some weddings on the weekend? And he's like, you know what? Sure, you're good company, come along. So for the next six to nine months, I would work nine to five retouching photos. And then in the evenings from 5 p.m. to 9 p.m., I was in the studio setting up his lighting and 
getting food and drinks for the for the families and the models and all the people that were coming through. And then um, Saturday, Sundays, I was in his car cruising around to all the weddings that he was shooting. And that was kind of my, like at the time, I remember it, you know, it was, I was like yeah, early 20s and it was horrible. My social life was gone. My life was finished. I was just working, working, working. But, you know, in hindsight, it was an amazing apprenticeship. Um, these days, you don't really get that opportunity very easily. So I was very grateful. Um, so just to quickly sort of fast forward, I did that for a while and then I ended up moving on and worked for a commercial photography studio. And then I moved on and worked for a family portrait photography studio. Again, probably my Gemini or something in me, like I can't really hang around for too long for some reason. And then I just started my own business. So I was shooting families and shooting everything and got into weddings. Um, got a bit burnt out by just by shooting everything. I was just had, I was just juggling, you know, I was marketing for families and I was doing headshots and I was doing model portfolios and weddings and it was all going well, but it wasn't very sustainable. And I got almost burnt out. So then I decided, you know, let's niche down. I'm going to ditch the family portraits. I'm going to ditch the headshots and just focus on weddings, which was great because then my whole website was weddings. The focus was weddings. The marketing was weddings. I really, really enjoyed shooting weddings. I loved the variety. Um, I loved the challenge of, of, of all of it, the weather, the people, the always a different location, the unknown, the flat tires, the <laughs> fainting bright, all of it. Um, so that was awesome. Um, throughout, so this is this yeah, sort of for the next sort of, I guess, eight years I was shooting, but I always wanted to create another side hustle. I don't know. Like I was just sort of forward thinking that I, I didn't want to be, um, you know, I didn't want to be maybe 50 or 60 or 70 and still shooting weddings. So mm -hmm. let's think of some other side hustles I could create, um, you know, and they were all some disastrous, some went okay. Uh, none of them really stuck from like co-sharing office spaces to photo booth hire to a topless waitering company, which, which I had uh, called Helpful Hunks, where these very attractive young men would go to hen's parties and serve, serve drinks. Um, but I guess, yeah, my passion wasn't really in any of them. So they all kind of flopped um, until one day... Yeah, where the idea of Studio Ninja came up, but we'll talk about that later. But yeah, that's kind of a short version, well, I guess maybe a long version of, <laughs> um, of yeah, my 20s and 30s up until now. That's one hell of a backstory. I love that very much. <laughs> Did a lot of things, yeah. <laughs> you and how about yourself? Before Studio Ninja, what was your journey? What did you do? Um, yeah, thanks, Chris, for <laughs> giving that um, uh, a, good, a good story there. It's good. Um, Always good to hear, even though I know I, I, I've heard it before. It's always good to hear hear it all again. Um, for myself, so I'll try to keep it short as well. I um, well, I was born in Malaysia, uh, so not born in Australia. Um, and I moved to Australia when I was 18 to um, study design. I uh, really wanted to get into design. I wasn't sure what part of design. I love uh, all kinds of sort of creative arts. Uh, drawing, painting, um, yeah, computer graphics. And I chose multimedia, not a term that we use anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but I chose multimedia because it was kind of had a variety of different things. I can have a try, I can try different things. I can try film, which I did a bit of filming and animation and motion graphics and web design and all kinds of different um, uh, digital media design. And from that, um, got out of university. The first job was to be a web designer. So I never really thought I would become a web designer. And it was, um, at that time, it was called web designer, really. That's, uh, I think people don't even use that word anymore, web yeah. designer. So, so old school. Um, it's lost sex appeal, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> like web design. <laughs> Why do you want to web design? Uh, but, uh, but yeah, uh, and uh, I think it was kind of at the, beginning of when social media was just, I think Facebook literally just appeared on the scene. And so it was MySpace, that's why it was the era of MySpace. And, um, and that, you know, changed really quickly. And suddenly, you know, um, to, be, to be working, to be designing for the internet was, was like really cool, was seen as a kind of a cool, cool place to be. Uh, and I did that for many, many years. I kind of went up the ranks of 
being a designer, worked for many different digital agencies, marketing agencies, um, and then kind of really just was really passionate about uh, designing uh, digital uh, websites, uh, experiences, platforms, software, uh, apps. Um, and then, um, yeah, also did a stint in advertising, uh, was, which was very fun, looking at a lot of campaigns for many, many different kinds of brands, you know, Australia, international. Um, and it was at the time I sort of thought I actually really enjoy image making, the process of image making. I love uh, photography. I never really learned it properly as uh, when in university. So I did went back to photography part-time, still had a design, uh, still worked full-time as a designer and um, studied photography part-time for about four years. Uh, and then during that time, I you know, did, a, you know, did some shoots, did some projects, shot a wedding, um, sort of dabbled. And then kind of got to the same conclusion that, oh, actually, if I really want to be a serious photographer, I'm going to start my career all over again. Mm-hmm. So I was like, well, I was already a uh, you know, established designer. And then you know, do I want to go back and do, do it all over again with photography? And I decided not to. So I was like, well, you know, photography would just be this thing that I do out of, out of enjoyment, something, something I love doing on the side. Um, I'll keep working as a designer. And then, you know, just like sometimes things just happen for a reason. And um, I uh, left advertising to start, a, start my own design agency. Uh, and that's how I met Chris, because uh, I was looking for a, a workspace for, um, to have myself and my business partner in the other um, design agency, uh, Yump. Um, and so I found this studio in South Yara. I was like, oh, you know, this run by a bunch of photographers. They're really cool. Uh, so let's, you know, move in did and see just, what happens. Did you just admit that I was cool? Did I just hear you say <laughs> I was cool? I, I heard that. Yeah, you know, it's actually like, <laughs> you know, not, not corporate. Because I, you know, yes. I came from more of a corporate background and I was used to people being kind of like, you know, very uh, image conscious, very, um, I don't know, like not relaxed. Hang on, hang on. Are you now saying that I dress like a bum? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> what you missed is he said that they were cool not you oh my gosh this interview is over <laughs> no, like, this guy shows out in a t-shirt and, and and sandals you know he's pretty relaxed showing me around the studio um but you know so yeah i mean we, we obviously love the vibe of um the co-work space hire a room started working there um and then yeah and then and then i guess you know we was have lots of chats about um, um, you know business and in general, and then you know the rest is history. But uh, we'll we'll talk about student ninja in a moment. But yeah, that's kind of how I end up uh, working basically in the same space as Chris. Amazing. So I mean, you guys have both had really established careers in their own right, all the way up to you know prior to Studio Ninja being born. So. Chris, give us an idea of kind of where Studio Ninja came from, why it started, how it was born. Hmm. Um, so like I briefly mentioned before, you know, I was always trying to find this, a side hustle. Um, I guess, yeah, there was, there was something else I needed to build and all these things kind of failed. And as time went on, I was sort of immersing myself more into podcasts and YouTube videos and audio books about business, about online businesses, about online marketing, about investing, all this sort of stuff. So um, I guess every day I was kind of like feeding myself with, with, I was listening to interviews with other software founders and all this different stuff, right? And um, I was kind of getting ideas all the time, but I specifically remember I was driving, I was driving at a wedding one day to the bride's house and then um, you know, I put on this podcast and it was, I, I specifically remember it. It was about, it was titled how to start a software company with no money. And I'm like, Hmm, this is interesting. Let's, let's listen to this one. This one could be, could be something here. And as soon as the interview, or as soon as this podcast started, I was just so in it and loving it. And I remember like arriving to the bride's house. I'm like, damn, why am I here already? I need some more time to finish this podcast, podcast episode. So we're like, you know, photographing the bride and doing the bride coverage and really excited to get back in the car to, to finish listening to this episode. And then as I was listening to it, the idea literally just came to me at that time um, where 
you know, I've been shooting weddings for a long time. I was using um, a CRM at the time because I was getting, just to help me manage stuff. Mm -hmm. But I was just thinking to myself, you know, this one that I am using, it is very good, but I'm only using about 10% of it. Like there's a lot of it that I'm not using. And actually that other 90% makes it quite complicated for me and makes it, again, in my opinion, you know, I'd log in and it's, it's cluttered with a lot of stuff that I just don't need and, and don't really look at. Um, so then that's literally where the idea came from. Maybe I can build something that's really, really simple. That's, that's only 10% of this other product um, that's clean and beautiful and enjoyable to use. And that was like the light bulb moment, literally driving to the ceremony. Um, so I finished listening to that episode and I got really excited. And he actually, in the episode, he sort of uh, detailed how to, actually, how to actually do it. So I got home that night, went to bed, woke up at like five in the morning and I literally started following the steps of this podcast episode on how to do this thing. So I, I mocked up some designs. I put together a website for it. Um, I went out to the Facebook groups that I was involved in and literally just put it out there. I'm like, guys, I'm going to build this amazing, awesome CRM and it's going to be so cool. And, you know, I'm looking for some early adopters. Um, who's, who's in with me? And luckily, or I don't know if it's luck or just the fact that I was involved in those communities and um, like, yeah, quite a, quite a few people, hundred people basically jumped on board and put a little bit of money into the idea. Um, so pretty much once we, once I hit the hundred, um, two things happen. One, the idea was validated, which is, which is great. It's, it's, it's proving to me that, um, you know, this business idea has legs. And two, I was absolutely terrified because I basically, like now I have to build this thing that I've never even have any experience in whatsoever. So, um, God, I even remember like spending days and days thinking of the business name. I'm like, what am I going to call this thing? Should I call it iStudio or Studio Cool? Or like, I don't know, like I, like I wrote hundreds of ideas down and I remember settling on Studio Ninja thinking, oh, that's like, Ninjas are like really cool and they're like, I don't know. I, I just loved it. So I settled on that. Anyway, um, then I remember like, like, like you and said, we would hang out, you know, every couple of weeks, have lunch and just shoot the shit about business. Like, like how's his business going? How's mine going? Have you got any new ideas in the pipeline? Maybe we can do this. Maybe we can do that. Uh, and pretty much over the two year period, it was like, bad idea, bad idea. <laughs> That's not going to work. Let's scrap this one. So then this one day, um, I'm like, hey, you and I, let's have lunch. And I'm, I've got this idea and, you know, it's called Studio Ninja and it's going to be a, you know, like a photography business app um, that's really simple and beautiful. And he's like, uh-huh. And then I said, well, I've got 100 people, 100 people on board. And he's like, really? And, we, you know, we, we talked about it for quite a while and um, sort of at the end, <laughs> we came to the conclusion where you and said, so Chris, do you actually know how to build this thing? I'm like, yeah, man, it's cool. I'll just like, you know, put together a, some, some stuff and send it off to someone to build. And he's like, oh man, you're in trouble. <laughs> um, so then the next day, basically you had approached me and said, you know, how about we do this together? And I'm like, oh, you know, maybe he's got a point. Maybe I don't know what I'm doing. Like I'm good at certain things, but there's definitely other things that I don't have skills in, which uh, I know that he has those skills and I don't. So uh, we agreed and we teamed up and Student Ninja was born. That was in June of 2015. Wow. Um, yeah, you wouldn't even jump in. Yeah, no, I was, I, was, I was, it's funny hearing from your side um, because when I saw, I, I, I think I asked, I asked, I asked Chris, I asked you, I said, um, uh, what, like, what, what's the specifications? Like, what are we showing, you know? You're like, oh, I've got some engineers working on it. And I was like, oh, can you just show me what it looks like? And I, I was looking at, I was like, oh, the design looks very nice, but there's only like two, three pages of description about how it should behave and the specification of, of, the, of, of the software. And I was like, oh, actually, I'm starting to get really worried for you. I was like, in my experience of working with engineers uh, for a long, long time, I was like, that's probably a little too, uh, too, still a little too, 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 too simple, like too high level. You know, we'll need to build out, you know, 50 pages of these specifications for it to be understood by, uh, by engineers. And because, um, you know, they're, they're, 
you know, we, we, even the most highly skilled engineers have to build to um, very detailed specifications. Um, and so I think I, I was like, I was literally expressing genuine concern that, <laughs> that whether this, this, this could actually work. <laughs> and then in that moment, I was like, oh, actually, I can help. You know, I'm, I, can, I, can, I can really flesh this out. And, um, and the other thing was, uh, because I've worked in agencies all my life, so working, you know, for uh, clients, for brands, building, building websites and apps and software, um, there's always, and you can ask any, any, anyone who's worked in a marketing agency before, in a digital agency before, it's like, there's always this, like, this little fantasy at the back of their head saying, oh, I wish I would have my own product one day. You know, I'd love to build an app one day, or I'd like to design an app. But I think the reality of saying actually you when you design your own app, it is like a really different, um, mentally really different from designing someone else's app. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think that little little fantasy at the back of my head sort of was like, oh, maybe I could, maybe, maybe, maybe this could happen. Maybe we could, we could, I could work on something that belongs to us instead of working on someone else's app. Um, and so I think that that was one of the reasons that that um that was that really drew me to student ninja uh and to yeah and also the fact that yeah i mean it's like oh you've got 100 people on board wow that's uh that's pretty cool knowing uh, that's guys, good i can totally see that chris was like yeah this is gonna work and this is gonna be amazing and i've already got these people and you're like whoa 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 i need the specs i need all of this written down i need this 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 and this and then we'll talk <laughs> well that's right i'm kind of yeah. floating around in this bubble of like everything's gonna be fine whereas if you had not come on board and I had gone down that road alone, it would have been a disaster. Like there's no doubt about it. Um, but, you know, that's why we work well together pretty much for the last seven years. I'm always floating around in this bubble of awesomeness while he's kind of, I wouldn't say bringing me down to earth, but just systematizing and just making sure everything's like my ideas are possible and um, actually bringing them to life actually. And, so yeah, it's been working quite well. A bit, a bit, a bit of grounding, a bit of grounding. Or you know, I, I don't like to like be the. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not the fun police. You know, I'm not like, <laughs> like the the, the harboring of bad, bad news. You know, I'm just like well, let's do a reality check. Absolutely, no, it's it's worked really well. So anyway, just like so really quickly to wrap that up. Um, you know, we spent about seven months, uh, kind of building a first version of it and releasing that to the first hundred people, and you know. Again, me floating around in this like fairyland. I thought, great, we're gonna we're gonna put it out there, and um, we're gonna be done. And it was, you know, it was a disaster. Everything went wrong. People couldn't sign up. Things weren't working. So we spent bugs a bit more time working on it. Yeah, bugs everywhere. And then we released it to the public in February, and I was really excited to basically retire that day, <laughs> um, which sounds stupid and ridiculous. But it was so like in my head, I literally thought I was gonna put it out there, and millions of people would come. And I put it out there and one person came. Mm-hmm. We had one sign up in February. I'm like, hmm, that's a bit, that's a tough pill to swallow. Like I thought, I thought this was going to be cool and people wanted this thing. And yeah, one, we had one person. So we kept working. And then in March, we had like three signups and we kept working and we were really close with these people. And then in April, we had like eight signups and then it was 15 new signups. And then it was 22 and then it was 30 and then 50. And, um, you know, I couldn't even bear to, to look back at those, what the product was six years ago. It was, you know, from everything I'd learned about building, it's like build quickly, get feedback and then improve. Like even if the product's terrible and it was, it was terrible. Um, But it was so good to get the feedback from these guys early so that we could make changes quickly and make improvements quickly and release and get feedback and make improvements. And like every two weeks, every month we were just like constantly working on it so there's kind of the backstory for you sally i'm not sure how much of that you already knew but maybe there's there some, there's a bit of insight there's information there for me definitely it's interesting actually chris because you, you know you say i think of a lot of photographers come into the industry thinking you know i'm going to put my website out there i'm going to second shoot a wedding or shadow a wedding and i'm going to be a photographer and i've just got a camera and that's me and people are just going to come to me and you thought the same things and you know when you kind of signed up for studio ninja when you thought this idea and you put it out there and you thought yes this is just going to work so it kind not of shows that that, you know marketing is it's needed for every business isn't it it's not just a case of you know photographers out there that are thinking well, you know i've i've got a website i've got my camera i've shot three weddings it, this should be working and it isn't it's also time like 
you know, I already had been running a business for so long. So like I, I understood marketing. I kind of knew what attracts customers, but I think um, like just not giving up too soon. Like, I mean, if, if, you, if you know you're on a good thing, it just takes time. Like just keep working on it, keep hustling, keep meeting people, keep, 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 keep. And then, you know, traction will come. I think these, these one in a million stories of overnight success. Um, yeah, it's just incredibly rare or they're bullshit like you know they think elon musk is overnight success but he tell you know he, he he only works 18 hours a day seven days a week you know every single day of the year for the last 15 years so like sometimes well, yeah it takes it's just you know it takes time and Absolutely. and I, I will add to that i guess uh listening as well like one one thing that we did have always you know we hope to continue doing it really well was constantly listening to our customers from day one uh, and just, yeah, just, you know, be humble. You know, if we only get one customer, that's okay. We get one customer, but we need to learn from that one customer. And also the other 10 who didn't sign up for, who didn't sign up with Shooter Ninja, what, what happened? Like what, what, could it, what we could have done better. And I think those early days uh, was very, very tough um, because, you know, you spend so much time and so much energy and, and, and also, you know, capital. Money. Um, yeah, your own savings, building this thing, and then kind of releasing to crickets. It was like no one liked it. Okay, uh, I I used to tell someone like it was um, um, and because when we when we did the original uh, crowdfunding exercise from hundred, uh, we called them our champion users uh, at the start. Um, you know they had to each each person would contribute one hundred fifty dollars. Um, for like a, 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 a lifetime, uh, it, was a, it was a lifetime 50%, I think, uh, 50% right. off. Um, and because we, we, you know, we, we had a great pitch. So Chris had a, this you know, beautiful website that really can say, you know, this, is the, this is what we want to build. Um, and it was, I found it actually, but once we actually have a product in the market and we say, oh, it's, you know, 30 bucks uh, to, for, 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 for a monthly subscription, it was interesting to know that it was much harder to get the 30 bucks compared to the 150 bucks that we got at the start. Mm -hmm. uh, because once it was on the market, people could, people could test the, the, the product, they could see the product. And so it was actually easier to sell this idea and much harder to sell the actual product. Mm -hmm. Because then when they actually use the product, they said, oh, yeah. that's, that's not, that's, you know, I wouldn't pay 30 bucks for that. Mm -hmm. And then you're like, oh, Really? <laughs> and then really, so really like learning from that process. Okay, so, you know, so what, you know, what would you be willing to pay for and what, how can it be better and what was missing and what wasn't there? What were you expecting that wasn't there? And really kind of just, yeah, really just drilling down on that and just working our butts off to, to make it possible. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I kind of forgotten that. It's like, yeah, it was easier to sell the idea than the actual thing. I think I maybe I just oversold it and just like sold people in this dream that as now is now there but at the start you know required some refining once we actually had a mini version of what that dream was but so maybe uh, yeah. maybe maybe they maybe they maybe they, they liked you that's why they paid 150 bucks right because they, they liked your they liked your vision and your passion for 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 studio ninja and that's why they they're buying they're buying your our passion but when you actually but when the you know when it's not the passion what it's here's the product try it and if you like it pay for it it's like <laughs> it's like it's like a really uh, like a real come down to to what actually works and what doesn't work um, well here's an interesting stat so uh, out of those 150 people i the deal was if at any time you're not happy or if you want to walk away i'll just give you money back right so 100 people gave me 150 dollars, which went towards developing the first version 100 and people. 100 people sorry 100 people gave me 100 dollars, and um only one person decided to get the money back. So it's it's a good stat. I was expecting basically everyone to just start running for the hills and demand refunds. But um, everyone trusted us, trusted our vision, and they they stayed on for the ride. So it was, it was quite quite nice, actually. Um, I, I still get to catch up with champion users even now, so many years on. You know, we'll still email, we'll catch up, we'll see how they're doing, they'll see how we're doing. And it's nice to, you know, those people were here way before I was and they're still here now. And I think 
a testament to to you guys really is you know it comes up an awful lot in our members group and just in general whenever Studio Ninja is mentioned it's that Studio Ninja genuinely care they genuinely listen you know there's actual people at the end of that that hear what you're saying and they take it on board whereas you know not even just a CRM company but any business out there it's a rarity isn't it that you have that contact and actually feel like your opinion is heard. That's the plan. So that's what we're going to keep doing. And we actually, it's enjoyable. I mean, um, look, I'm not going to lie. <clears throat> Every now and then we hear things that we don't want to hear, but at the same time, that's what we need to hear. Mm. And that's how we grow. So um, that's what we're going to keep doing. Love it. Day by day. So we've done a little round robin on Studio Ninja and we know now where you guys are from, how Studio Ninja was born. And what some of our listeners might not know is that you've just released a brand new book, which is really exciting. So Shoot Like a Ninja. Ewan, can you tell us a little bit more about the book, why you guys wrote it, where it came from? Uh, Yeah. Um, So, you know, I've always sort of thought, you know, between the two of us, you know, Chris is the photographer and... Uh, you know, much more established as a photographer. I kind of just dabble in it. So I wouldn't even call myself a professional uh, by any means. Um, but I love photography. And I always thought if I was to be involved in uh, a, a business, you know, it would be, it would dream to mix both design and photography. And that's what happened with Shido Ninja. Mm-hmm. Um, and this idea that, because um, we, what we have, what we see often is, you know, we do get feedback when, when users unsubscribe or when, you know, when, when they, uh, and one of the biggest reasons that came that we, we've seen a lot of is that, you know, my business isn't working, I'm not earning enough money, uh, I'm not generating enough income for photog- photography. And, you know, seeing that feedback, a lot of that feedback over time kind of made, made us realize that, oh, maybe there's something there that, you know, we, especially uh, given how much we know about, you know, business and photography, maybe there's something here that we could really help uh, our, our customers in some way. Um, and I guess getting into education was not really like a focus for us. It was always being focused about the product itself. But I thought, hey, maybe, you know, maybe there's something here we could, um, we could, I don't know, come up with a webinar or a workshop or something that could help, uh, photographers, you know, get better in business. Um, and, and I think, um, I, at the same time, I was, um, also going through a, um, business accelerator program um, in, in, in Sydney. Uh, it's called um, Key Person of Influence. So it's run by a, a company called Dense and they're, they're really, really awesome. Um, and it was going through that, that, um, that program. Um, one of the things that they talk about was this idea of writing a book. Um, and, and that sort of kind of seeded, I think, in my head that, um, you know, maybe I could, I not, never saw myself as an author. Uh, and I thought maybe, Maybe we can explore this idea a little bit. Um, sort of just say, yeah, I came, came, came back to Chris and was like, hey, you know, what do you think about writing a book together? And I think Chris was like, oh, I'm not sure that that's, that's me. <laughs> so I think there was a, both a reluctance on our part to see ourselves as, as, as authors. We're like, oh, we're not writers. You know, you know, we're, we're, you know we're, we're, we're good at doing what we do, but we're not re- necessarily really good at writing. Um, so, but, but the thing with going through... Um, uh, is that you can, you know, you can get some help potentially. Um, and I think going through the program, there were, you know, the idea was to just put your ideas on a paper. Uh, it doesn't matter, like forget about the fact that you're not a, a good writer or not, you know, you don't see yourself as an author, but what you need to do is just put your ideas down on a paper. And I think that was kind of, I started from that, that um, at that point. And it was like, just write whatever comes to your mind, right? Just like, it's literally like a, like a brain dump of what, what you have in, 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 in your head. Um, and I think in about three months, this is going back, you know, two and a half years ago, I wrote like, I don't know, 15,000 words, just, you know, like a stream of consciousness about, about what, you know, what, how, how this book should be structured. <laughs> and I think the original um, idea was to think of kind of like, you know, three or four steps that a photographer can, uh, can take to go from, you know, just kind of starting out to having an established business. Like what are the sort of things that we could, uh, we can uh, distill down to. And uh, very early on in that process, um, I guess we came up with this structure that there'll be kind of four steps um, in that, you know, obviously the, the, the book will go into a lot of detail about it, but essentially 
it is to uh, start with a niche uh, and then go hard on the marketing and then work really hard on your conversion. And then eventually you get to streamline and automate a lot of your processes. So that's kind of the four, the four steps. Um, and yeah, and uh, so did the first draft really quickly in, in three months and I literally went, oh my God, that is so shit. I'm not going to look at that for a while now. It's like, it's good to get it out, but it's so far away from what I think of where a book should be. Uh, and so literally just put it on the, on the shelf and not looked at it for like two years. Um, and then I think maybe it was in COVID, COVID, COVID happened as well. So that, that fit up some time, you know, we were sort of on top of things. The engineers were a little bit ahead and uh, we, we kind of had a little bit of available time. So we sort of re-dived into it. Um, and I kind of gave into the idea of, all right, let's do this. And yeah, I, think, uh, I, I convinced, I convinced Chris, I convinced you to, uh, uh, say, you know, forget about the book. Why don't, why don't you write it like a, like it's a webinar, like a presentation or like a workshop that you're giving to, um, uh, uh, yeah, to, 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 to a photographer, like what, what, what will be, what will be in it? That's right. So <laughs> then I had the same brain dump. I spent like three months every morning, waking up, having a cup of coffee, jumping back in bed with my laptop and just writing for one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. And it's interesting because generally I'm not a writer. I'm not a good writer and I don't really enjoy writing. Um, but when you sort of force yourself to do something, I just adapted and I started becoming enjoyable. Like literally the hardest part is writing the first sentence, like mm -hmm. actually sitting there and using it, like thinking of the first sentence. And I found once that first sentence came out, this got in flow and just, just started, um, I guess, writing my version of those four steps. And I, I had actually experienced those four steps. So I was kind of writing my own, not so much my life story, but a lot of my own experiences, a lot of my own horror stories actually as well. Um, and the good thing is with this book, like running Ninja or Studio Ninja, uh, it's not just my opinion or my idea. We also have access to hundreds, if not thousands of photographers that we talk to every day, that you talk to as well, Sally, really famous photographers, very established photographers, very successful photographers. And we've spoken to those people. So the book has ended up being a combination of essentially my horror stories, like everything that went wrong in my career, uh, as well as my wins, in combination with, you know, amazing advice and opinions and, and knowledge from these other people who are highly successful. And it's the book's kind of, it's like half comedy, half, you know, real um, blueprint or, you know, just just what you have to do to, to do well. Um, actually, it's a good, good reminder, Chris. I forgot about, yeah. uh, I actually almost forgot about the part where uh, when, when in even in the early days of writing it, I thought, you know, I really need to talk to a few uh, really established photographers to really understand their perspective. So, you know, did a, you know, talk to and you see many of these stories in the book uh you know with scott johnson kristen cook um joe aston Every, everyone had really interesting perspectives uh mark rosetto uh andrew helmich uh we had yeah it was really enjoyable uh interviewing them talking about the experiences and working all those elements into the book um so yeah that was actually a big part of the book as well so it wasn't just you know my brain dump or Chris's brain dump. It was also perspectives from many different um, top photographers who are really, really good at what they do. Absolutely. I mean, Chris, you briefly jumped into it there, but didn't really give any examples. So I feel like I've got to back our listeners a little bit here and try and get some of those out of you. So there's a lot of personal stories in the book from yourself. Any that you're happy to share with us now? Hmm. Uh, all right. Two come to mind. Um, so one, you know, we'll start with a horror story. This, this, this will hopefully um, resonate with some people or whatever. So, so this one day, it's a beautiful summer day. <clears throat> I put um, my bag in the car and I'm ready to shoot a wedding. So I jump in, say goodbye to the family, and I'm driving across town one and a half hours to where the wedding's being held, where the groom lives. <clears throat> and like always, I arrive on time, I'm five minutes early, I've been listening to, to podcasts or music and I'm, I'm kind of ready to rock and roll doing my pre-wedding amp up. <clears throat> and I'm like, awesome. I've got a beautiful couple. It's a beautiful day in a beautiful location. Uh, this is going to be the best wedding. And I jump out of my car and I 
I open the boot, like the, the, the trunk or the back of my car to get my camera bag. And it's, it's empty. Like I've literally, there's no camera bag in my car. Um, so what, what actually, I actually put my lunchbox, like my lunch, my, like my esky in the car. And that was, that's what I did back home. And I literally just forgot my camera bag. So I'm, I'm an hour away from, hour and a half away from home, about to walk into this groom's house. Like I'm, I'm li- almost late now. I'm like, what the, what the F am I going to do? Like, how, like, oh my gosh. So, I mean, I'm sort of talking this down, but I was literally freaking out, like, like so sweat pouring. I'm like, oh my I God. Like, this, is, this is like literally the worst case scenario. Like <clears throat> I'm a professional photographer getting paid so much money and that's not like getting paid a significant amount of money. Um, it's like a truck driver for getting their truck at home. I mean, like how can, <laughs> how can me being a photographer leave my camera bag at home? Basically useless. So I sent a message to my wife. <clears throat> I'm like, I, oh my gosh, like, I need to call you immediately. Hold up, like I need a solution. All right, can you please grab my camera bag and drive it to the bride's house? She's like, but the kids are screaming, they're hungry, they're tired. I'm like, I just need this camera bag. Can you just please? So she put the screaming kids in the car, put my camera bag in her car and basically drove an hour and a half and dropped it at the bride's house. So that was solution number one for the rest of the day. I'm like, great. So now I'm here. What am I going to do? So I'm like, all right. I'm just going to own it. So I knocked on the door. I'm like, mate, how are you? I'm ready to rock and roll. Like, oh, Chris, we're so excited to see you. I'm like, oh, but I've just got one thing I have to tell you. Um, you know, I, was, I made up some story. I'm like, I was arguing with the missus and I just ran out of the house. And I'm really, this is going to sound crazy, but I've left my camera bag at home. And he sort of looks at me blankly like, you're kidding, right? Like, you, no, you didn't. You're like, no. I'm like, yep, I did. But I've got my phone and I'm in a good, I'm ready to go and you guys are ready to go. So this is what we've got right now. So let's do it. And he sort of cocked his head, thought for a second. And he's like, all right, you know, I'm not going to, he, I loved, this is probably very rare. And I just had a groom that was very understanding, but he was like, all right, this is the situation. I'm not going to let it ruin my day. As long as the camera bag is arriving at the bride's house for the rest of the day, then that's all sorted. So I was like, come on in. And he basically spent the morning laughing at me because I was standing there like an idiot with my phone, but doing all the shots like I normally would and, and joking with them and getting ready and um, having beer. And it, like, and I said to him, you know, I will refund completely if, if you want. And um, he got the photos and was very happy. So I think I dodged a bullet there. That was pretty much the worst thing that could ever happen. And uh luckily survived that one listening to that (laughs) oh man like I think a lot of photographers have had nightmares about that but never actually experienced it and going through it I think I came out unscathed but um you know now I double check triple check and put a reminder and a workflow task that I have to do this thing before even stepping foot in my car um so I definitely learned my lesson and look maybe one other funny story This, this is a bit unique um how I got my first ever customer so when I started my own business uh, in photography, I started doing family portraits. Um, and, you know, you, you photograph some friends and whatever the inner circle, that's all for free to kind of get a bit of portfolio happening. I'm like, oh, how am I going to actually get a customer? So I was just brainstorming one day, again, listening to podcasts and just kind of thinking, I'm like, oh, you know what would be really interesting? Um, when someone gets their braces off, once they've gone through an orthodontic treatment and they get their braces off, wouldn't that just be a great time where you're like, you're really happy and you're really proud of your smile. Wouldn't that just be a great time to kind of take some photos? It's like, hmm. So I built some vouchers and I went around to a whole bunch of orthodontists just like saying, Hey, can I have a meeting? I'm like, how about I give you this free voucher where anyone who finishes their orthodontic treatment and gets their braces off, you just give them a gift. It's a free photo shoot and they get, you know, the free shoot and they get a free print and it's, you know, it's, it's great value for you as the business owner to give your client a gift and a congratulations for finishing, you know, their orthodontic treatment. It's great for the, his, his or her customer to receive a gift. And it's great for me because I might get a client. Mm-hmm. And uh, funny enough, I emailed about, I don't know, 300 orthodontists and I got a few meetings and a few, a couple said yes. So I mocked up the voucher. I printed it the same day. I went back to them, like, here's the voucher. And then the phone rang the next day. So um, I guess from like a marketing point of view, there's always interesting, unique, unusual ways to find customers. So it's not always, 
you know, build a website and that will come or put it on Google and it will come. There's always lots of other unique ways. So that, that's a little... Box. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that was kind of, I guess, there's, there's, there's lots of examples in the book, but there, there's two sort of interesting ones for you. Love that. Thank you very much. You and are there any other examples, anything kind of real life experiences or something from the book that you can maybe share to help photographers streamline their business and really get that admin down to a T? Uh, yeah, so um, I think Chris kind of touched on some of our marketing because um, we talk about the four steps again, you know, the the niching, the marketing, the conversion, and then the streamlining. And I feel like uh, when we're looking, when we're thinking about how this should be structured, the, you know, before you can even stream, so when you get to the, the, the fourth step about streamlining, and there's a lot of good examples there, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. But before you kind of get there, the first step is so important, which is like, you need to really understand what, what your niche is. And I think when, when everyone starts out, you know, doing everything, you know, that doing these a little bit, of, a little bit of portrait, a little bit of, of family, a little bit of wedding. So even just kind of get a sense for, you know, what do I enjoy doing most? Or where, where do I gravitate towards? Or where are my customers coming? What am I good at? Um, and kind of there's a little bit of experimentation at the beginning, but I do think that at some point you kind of have to pick a niche uh, and, and kind of go hard at it. And the reason for kind of picking a niche at the start is when, when you kind of get to the marketing and the conversion is, you know, when, when we talk about marketing and streamlining, you can be doing so many things. And if you have so many different uh, type of business that you're doing or you're working on different streams of photography, you're just going to really kind of burn yourself out trying to do so many different marketing activities and, and building different types of workflows for all types of different uh, photography uh, jobs. And that's just going to, make you basically and you only have so much everyone has 24 hours in the day right and then we, we we just end up you know spending so many hours doing things and not kind of being very targeted about what we want to do so that niching part really sets up everything else so kind of once you kind of get your niche and i think niching is always a work in progress it's not like you know set it set and done and then that's it i think we're always kind of working out where our niche is you know as the as the as it gets more competitive and, and, you know, you may start out with a niche and then suddenly there are 10 other photographers doing the same thing. You go like, okay, how am I going to niche this a little bit differently now? So I think that's always a work in progress. But once we kind of have a niche, we can really work really hard at, at increasing our advantage in, in that niche. And I think that's, that, that niching really flows really well into the other three steps. So once we do get to the, the streamlining, so, you know, we have some of the marketing examples that Chris has talked about. Um, we're getting into the conversion side. I think one of the biggest things that photographers can be doing is really spend a lot of time thinking about your workflow. Um, I think that when we first started, we just kind of went, okay, well, now I got a client's email. This is what I'll write to them. And, you know, you, you sort of go, you kind of, it's also, it's all in your head, right? So you, you know what to, write to, your, write, to your, write to your client the moment they reply to you. And then after a long time or after several times doing it, you might start to realize that actually they, they, there's, some, there's, there's a trend or there's a pattern where, you know, straight away, straight away after receiving the initial inquiry, you, know, you can write a particular kind of email mm -hmm. and, then, and, then, and, then, and, and then you have an appointment and that's the kind of email that you will write. And then, and, and then, you know, um, as it leads up to the actual, actual shoot, there's other emails that you can be writing. So I think thinking about that workflow is really, really important. And you probably need to spend a little time thinking about it and to really plan it out. I feel like uh, some people also rush through it or be like, oh, I just want a template. Just give me a template and I can run with it. But actually everyone's different. And you, you, you will find something that's unique to your style and the way you want to communicate is something that you want, that shows off your personality. So I feel like that's an area that uh, every photographer, every business really, actually it's not just photography, you know, it could be design. I mean, it applies to an agency as well, a design agency or marketing agency. Every business should spend time thinking about their, 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 their workflow and how, and how they want to communicate with their clients. Chris, do you have anything to add about workflows? I think that's... Oh, I mean, I can deep dive into this quite a lot. Like even... Um... You know, it's like, where are you spending your time and where is it most valuable? And like, again, another real life example is, um, God, it was interesting writing this book and actually formalizing all of it. I was kind of doing it subconsciously and fluffy leading up to where I am now. But, um, 
you know, a, a real life example is um, not so much workflow specific. Well, I guess it is, but um, you know, being a photographer, you're not just a shooter. You know, like you're you're a marketer. You're you're doing your books. You're doing you're doing a lot of like many 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 things, right? So I enjoyed quite a lot of the tasks that were involved in running the business, but over time, I found personally that you know editing my weddings was slowly becoming painful and what used to take me four hours now started taking me 12 hours and you know um as i did it more and more i just found i'm like oh like i spend an hour and then i'll you know maybe go to the fridge and i'll spend another 20 minutes and i'll check some emails and then i'll spend another half hour and i'll start vacuuming my house yeah. just because like i just really just started not enjoying it. And then this, this small task became this mega task that dragged on for so much time. Mm. So then, um, you know, I decided to outsource this, 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 this part of my business. At first I thought, how is anyone going to possibly, you know, do this better than me? And how are they going to know what my, my vision was when I was taking the photo? But I'm like, you know, if I don't, if I don't do it, I'm going to be stuck doing this forever. So let's just take the plunge and see how we go. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I went to a couple of companies and I just found the experience, the onboarding was actually so much more enjoyable than I expected. I, I just didn't know what to expect. So I reached out to a few companies and they spoke to me. They talked to me about my editing style. They did their research on my website of how I edit and they were very prepared. And at the end of the day, they actually did a much better job than I did um, in a much shorter time period. I could, I could shoot a wedding on a Saturday, um, have it culled, by Monday and off to the editor Monday afternoon and I have it back by Wednesday. Like, oh my God, the turnaround is insane, which, which then leads to other positive things in the business. Like you're just completely surprising your couple that they're getting their photos back so quickly. Whereas sometimes, uh, you know, people may have the reasons for it, but sometimes it takes three months, four months, five months for couples to get their photos back. So once actually, once that part clicked, I'm like, oh my God, I can actually outsource some of my business. And it cost me a tiny bit of money, but the 12 hours that it saved me now I can do marketing or I can be shooting another job or I can be spending time with my kids. And like all of that is more important to me than spending the 12 hours of my time in my business editing those photos that someone else can do better. Um, and I can make more money than what it's cost to me to edit those photos. So I guess that's not necessarily specifically workflow related, but it's like a pain point that I had that I found a solution for, which resulted in way more time and enjoyment in running my business. Yeah. Um, it's all kind of adding into your workflow too, isn't it? Like, yes, you know, part of your workflow now perhaps is sending that out and outsourcing that part of your business. But I think yeah. that's often a pain point that a lot of photographers have and they're scared to make that jump to outsource anything, not necessarily just the editing side of things, but they always think, well, it's my business. I should be doing it all. Yeah. Like another one that quickly comes to mind, you know, like we have a small feature and I'm pretty sure all the photography business apps have this feature but it's an automatic payment reminder. So before I had a software to help me run my business, you know, I would, I would open a Word document and create an invoice and send it and then wait to be paid. So I check my bank account every day and it's not getting paid and suddenly it's overdue and then I'm chasing it. And I feel awkward and I'm trying to figure out how to word this, this email to chase the money. But then multiply that by 50 weddings by each wedding is three payments broken down. So it's like 150 times a year I'm doing this stupid task which is uncomfortable and awkward and i'm forgetting and there's times where brides or grooms would be following up with me after the wedding hey chris do you want to get paid because we haven't paid you yet I'm like oh my god how did i miss this so this was just like a massive pain point such a small thing but as soon as you know before i was using ninja or now that i'm using ninja like having that automatic payment reminder just just like it's so useful that the system while I'm sleeping or is just remembering when the payments are due and if they're not paid the system automatically reminds those people to pay and I just never it's like one part that I never have to worry about again I just send the original invoice and just sit back and the system does everything for me so I guess that's just another um another one out of many many things that using a or having a system uh can can start automating a lot of this process for you and um uh very 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 useful and valuable um, I have a similar pain point with questionnaires actually so I had a good year before I discovered Studio Ninja as a user 
um, where I would get to like a week, two weeks before a wedding and I'd go on to look at timings to kind of start to arrange a call with them. And I'd realized that I'd not sent the questionnaire to them. So I had no information for the day. And we were just like a couple of weeks before the wedding or a week before the wedding, I think was the worst case. And then I just felt like such an idiot sending it to them last minute. It looked like I'd just forgotten about it, which I had. Um, and now every time I go into a client on Studio Ninja, like a week, two weeks, four weeks, even now before the wedding, the question I was all filled out. I've not had to lift a finger and it's just sent it all automatically. And every time I look at it, I go, oh, that's so much better. <laughs> It's amazing how these simple things can have such a big impact. Like even when Ewan was saying about those emails, uh, for example, you know, six weeks before a wedding, I have an email that automatically goes out that says, hey, your wedding's coming up. I'm so excited. Um, you know, let's start getting the ball rolling on prepping some stuff. Um, uh, can you please answer these questions for me? Or can you please give me a buzz and we can arrange a time to, to catch up, have a coffee and talk about the schedule or whatever. Like, although these emails are automatic and in some case you could say they're generic but they can definitely be written in a way that when the client is receiving them it feels like you've written it and like it's it's this balance between automation and losing um personal making touch. yeah losing person touch exactly but if you write it in a certain way like this couple it's way more important that they get that email even if it's like 5% less personal touch than mm -hmm. forgetting and losing track and da, 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 da. So, um, you know, these automated emails, these automated payment reminders, they're just so, I, you know, there was a time where well, I'm still shooting weddings. So it's like, you know, I've got a family, I'm shooting weddings and I'm running Ninja and I wouldn't be able to do it if Ninja wasn't automating those processes for me. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah. Um, I've go. had a couple of instances actually recently where I've turned up at weddings and I start to, you know, just talk in passing about the group shots and things that the couple have asked for that are all on the questionnaire. So they're all, I know exactly what's happening and who I need. Um, and I actually forget sometimes some of the questions that I've put into the questionnaire. And there is a question in my questionnaire that asks for, um, someone to be the go-to person to help me grab the people that I need that knows everybody from both sides of the family. And right. even just on Saturday, um, the bride said to me in bride prep, she was like, um, oh yeah, because I remember that you asked for that um, in your email like two weeks ago. And I'm like, did I? <laughs> and then I remember that it's in my questionnaire and, you know, it again, just takes out all that organization because it's all already done. Well, you would have obviously thought about that at some point, right? So yeah. it's, you know, you're aware of it, you added it in and now it's an autopilot. So that's, that's awesome. Definitely. So I can't let this podcast go by without asking you what is in store for Studio Ninja for the future. So maybe you and you could take this one. Any exciting plans in the pipeline? Well, I guess from a product perspective, uh, our goal is still to make Studio Ninja as easy to use as possible while enhancing our features so that uh, photographers can reduce even more admin and save more time. So to do that, we, uh, you know, we publish and update our roadmap every year. And currently on the roadmap, we have you know, workflow improvements, online booking and scheduling. Uh, this is a feature so that photographers, photographers' clients can book shoots and meetings while the photographer sleeps. Uh, we've got multiple tax rates for our American and European friends. Um, we also want to support more different languages around the world, we already support French, Spanish, Norwegian, German, Dutch, and Italian, and soon we'll be adding Portuguese, Swedish, and Czech. Um, we'll also be doing more integrations uh, with Square and other popular payment methods uh, and partners and accounting platforms, and we'll continue to improve and update our app uh, and improve its user experience and introducing uh, push notifications. God, they're so busy. <laughs> <laughs> so much going on jeez Absolutely. it sounds like we've got a jam-packed few years ahead chris is there God. anything that you can tell us about too i'm glad he's in charge of all that stuff that's uh that sounds like a lot of stuff um <laughs> yeah look we're always improving our education side so i'm going to keep offering more free education and including more coaches into our master classes so that our users can just jump in there being a, being a ninja, you can jump in there and get free masterclasses essentially about your workflows, how to make more money, about how to improve your marketing, improve your branding, all this sort of stuff. Um, you know, and of course, we're looking for more partnerships with other photography products. So our users will get access to those products uh, at a discount, which is very nice. 
And as always, you know, we offer free one-on-one -on -one training for our users. We offer free migration if you're coming to us from another product or if you have a thousand post-it notes <laughs> on the wall and need help uh, putting that into our app. Um, actually, can you cut that out, Sally? I don't want that to be live on this show. <laughs> Otherwise, the <laughs> team's going to kill me. And um, yeah, look, we're also constantly adding new templates into the product as well. So as a new user, you jump in. And um, you're not just, you don't start with a, with a blank slate. Um, there's already free email templates, workflow templates, contract templates, questionnaire templates. And we'll be adding more and more stuff uh, as we go on just to help our photographers. Um, you know, they can use those templates as they are, or they can obviously modify them to be more on brand with their own business. But it's a great I starting point to have those in the system kind of to, to kind of help you notice, get notice, And I'm sure our, our listeners will as well, that obviously to have come this far, to be this far down in the journey in Studio Ninja, to have done everything that you guys have both done, you're two very motivated, driven, passionate people. So I'd love to pick your brains on what motivates you both. Chris, if you want to go first. Hmm. How do, you, how do you answer this without sounding too cliche <laughs> or too soppy? Um, you know what, like, you know, if you'd asked me this question in my early 20s, I would have been like, money motivates me, right? And then, you know, time goes on and it's not only Ninja, there's other things in my life that I do which has similar motivation. I find I get really motivated when I notice that things that I'm doing are making a positive impact on other people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, there's obviously the ninja side of that, but even on the personal side, like um, for, for, what one example. So I exercise almost every day, right? And I thought, you know what? I'm, I'm doing it anyway. Why don't I open up my house and invite my neighbors and some local people in the area to come and do it with me? Mm -hmm. So I'm like, cool, let's do that. So, you know, I'm doing it anyway. So let's, let's, let's do it. So I open up every day, I open up my garage and, you know, now there's about six or eight people that join me for the exercise that I'm already doing. And I've been doing that for a few months now. And now, you know, these people are, they're like, Chris, like I've, I've quit my gym membership and I'm, I'm, I've been re-inspired to exercise. I've got my butt off the couch. I'm eating better. I'm feeling better. I can do more things than I could before. And I'm so grateful that you've decided to do this. And that wasn't the motivation. Like originally I was like, cool, let's just do this because I want to socialize with some extra people. But the byproduct is, you know, I am putting a bit of effort into it and, you know, like 30 or 40 people are being positively, like they're, they're really, yeah. I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's, uh, it's really interesting to sometimes hear the feedback, like, wow, create, like, like this has really made a positive change in my life. And that's just awesome. Yeah. Um, and it's, I do that in lots of other personal stuff, but on the ninja side, uh, I guess I am motivated by uh, one, like the challenge of building this thing that's very, very difficult to do mm -hmm. uh, on the business side and the product side. Like it's, it's the same thing, but essentially like it's very hard to do what we're doing mm -hmm. and that's motivating. Uh, it's something that I didn't know how to do and we've learned how to do and we've done it or we're doing it. Um, but then again, on the people side, like it's hard to describe how good it feels when I get a phone call or a text message or a video recording of someone telling me that Chris Studio Ninja has, you know, allowed me to spend so much more time with my kids. Like I didn't have that before. And now because of Studio Ninja, the product that you guys have built, I've got so much more time to enjoy with my children, which I didn't have before. And I'm like, holy shit, that is just something I hadn't thought of that's happening. And, you know, I've had one, one, I wouldn't say it's crazy, but it was just super unexpected where a woman had messaged me saying, you know, this product has saved our marriage. I was spending so much time ignoring my partner and doing admin and being grumpy and moody and I was forgetting things and I was taking it out on, you know, my life at home. But now that it's all done, it's all automated and done for me, like literally it's like re reinvigorated and set a new fire in my marriage and it's totally saved us. And that's so not what I was expecting to ever hear from anybody. And the fact that it's kind of doing that, you know, Ninja is kind of doing that to a broad range of people like around the world yeah. is um, it definitely is motivating. And I guess the last thing that comes to mind, uh, probably the most cliche part is just like, I guess I want, I want my kids to one day think that their dad 
did a good job. You know, he was he was there for for them, and he's 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 positively contributed to the world, to people's lives. And I guess yeah, I, I would like them to one day think that they're proud of me and that, that you know I've done something good. So that's probably the biggest motivation. A hundred percent. I'm sure they already think that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're too yeah. little to know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> you and what about you? What what motivates you? Well, I think Chris has really touched on most of them, uh, which I think we share, uh, which is why we work well, we work really well together. Okay. Um, so I, I guess on top of everything he said, I sort of feel like I don't have a lot to add, but I'll probably just say one thing, which you know, as a as a as a, as a creative that you know, many people might might be able to relate is I've always loved the process of uh, creation the idea that like there was nothing and now there's something mm -hmm. it's like this idea that it was a blank piece of paper and then and then you know then and i've been able to fill it with with you know my thoughts or whatever it is and and then this this and then this you know and then it just keeps adding that like, this this beautiful thing has emerged yeah. and now it's helping people and now it's making an impact on everything else uh, that, that you know influencing or helping other people achieve better in their life and, and benefit from that. I just think that's such a, that's, yeah, that, that really makes me really happy. Um, that process of creation. So, you know, if it's not, you know, if, if I wasn't, if I wasn't working on Studio Ninja, if it wasn't an app that we're building, it would be something else. There'll be another project. There'll be some, you know, it, it, it could be a, it could be photography. It could be design. It could be something, it, it could be anything, but this idea that there was nothing and then suddenly, you know, we put a lot of hard work into it and something has emerged from that. I think that's a, yeah, that's just an incredible thing. Um, it's not just a something anymore either, is it? You know, student <laughs> is a, it's a known name in the industry. It's a household name of, you know, the photography industry. And you say Studio Ninja and people go, don't go, what's that? People go, oh yeah, Studio Ninja. Like that's one hell of an achievement. And that's so totally to... not what, and that's totally unexpected. Like, yeah. We just went into it thinking, oh, it'll be this cool little project. If I my little pet project, <laughs> if only if only I'm the only person who looked at it and it only helps a few people, I'll be happy with that. But you know, now that it's a, uh, it's you know, it is something, uh, and then, you know, we're obviously always very grateful and and to be working on it, and we still have fun working on it, and yeah, it's it's kind of a dream. So love it, fantastic. You and if you can add a final piece of advice, we'll wrap this lovely conversation up now. Something that has made a big difference to your business or your personal life, something our listeners can take away with them. What would that advice be? Uh, I will, I will say something that's funny because Chris said, oh, if I was much younger, I would say this. I, in the same way, like if you was asking me this question like 10 years ago, like, uh, you know, work hard or like you know, something like that and like something really cliche, yeah. like hard work or go. So, but uh, I think as I got got older, I realized that actually one thing uh, that have really helped me over time is, you know, we all work hard. We all, you know, try our best. We all put in a hundred percent, you know, we have good ideas, we, but often I find that um, uh, what's really helped me was knowing when to ask for help. So I'll get to this point in my career or in my business where I'll, I'll be like, um, you know, I, I'm stuck. You know, I don't know how to get any more sales. I don't know how to get any more leads. Um, I, like I've hit, I've hit a, 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 I don't know, a, a plateau of some sort. Um, and, and what's always changed is this, um, you know, I might have said, what, what, the first thing I did was, um, one of the first thing, things I did when I was struggling in business was when I had, had a business coach. I uh, went through a business accelerator program. Um, and then later on, you know, you know, I had uh, a life coach and, and, you know, it's not always that I'm doing it constantly. So I don't have someone that, that is like, I'm not doing it weekly, but it's just at certain points in my career and my business, I thought I really need help. And I talked to someone, uh, even if it's just for, you know, three months, six months, 12 months, it just changed everything. Because um, suddenly you have this different perspective on how things uh, should, uh, are working, and you realize that you know you are not the only person with all these all these problems. Mm -hmm. Like, oh, okay, I don't have enough time, I don't have enough sales, I don't have enough leads, uh, I don't have enough money. You realize that actually there's like thousands of people with the same problems, and there are solutions. Mm -hmm. And those solutions, you you can't see it where you are, but when you have a coach or when you have someone you can talk to suddenly they're like, actually, the solution is not that hard. 
you know, just do one, two, three, four, five things. And in three months time, you'll be in a lot, you know, be in a much better position. So I've always found those, uh, you know, the people who have helped me along the way um, with uh, their advice and their mentorship have, have just been uh, invaluable. And so that's what I'll say to uh, any listener. If, yeah, ask for help. You just never know. That's a super piece of advice. Thank you, Ewan. Chris, how about you? Uh, just to touch on you, I, I guess um, some some photographers or some, some some listeners may think a coach is maybe too... Uh, sometimes it's okay just to talk to a friend. Like just instead of being at home stuck alone, reach out to a friend who then might introduce you to another friend. And then, you know, you start, you get introduced to something to... Like it just kind of gets the ball rolling. Mm-hmm. I think um, a coach is absolutely an amazing idea. But sometimes if that may seem too scary for you, I think the point is also don't just be alone. Like just... just Ask for help from anybody and you'll be surprised how helpful people are. Um, on my end, I guess I had a, I had a few uh, like milestone incidences in my life, which I think looking back in retrospect now have kind of shaped a bit of my personality or whatever. Um, one is for, about, for a 10-year period in my early 20s, I worked uh, as a disability care worker part-time or casually, I guess you could say. So every week, once or twice a week, I would hang out with uh, my friend George, who had a pretty severe disability called spinal muscular dystrophy, which basically means that over time, your muscles are deteriorating over time rather than growing. Mm -hmm. So I spent a significant amount of my time in my 20s hanging out with this guy who wasn't able to get out of bed by himself, wasn't able to um you know go to the shower by himself wasn't able to he needed help with everything with eating with with everything but at the same time he was an incredible man who had his own business he was consulting every day he would go to work in the city we would catch a taxi um he would be he was very well known in the disability uh, sector people would look at him for advice he would public speak he entered a comedy show he finished his phd he did more things than the average person would ever even think about accomplishing, right? And on top of that, every day I saw him, he was always smiling. And I'm talking about, like, imagine the challenges this guy would have. Like, he would want to go to the library, but he can't go inside because there's a step, right? So it's like you're constantly all day being hit with, like, roadblocks. And yet he was still able to achieve all these things um, with a smile on his face. So... I kind of just reflect back on that. I'm like, if this guy can't even go to the toilet by himself, unfortunately, but he's able to achieve all these things, how the F can we really complain about anything? Like, I was was thinking about myself. How can I possibly complain about being hungover or any stupid, like, like irrelevant thing to my life? Like, I think, I think working with him put a really positive spin on my life and made me really appreciate um, what we have. That was a big one in shaping sort of, I guess, my motivation and general positivity. Um, and it's another really quick story. Uh, when I was, I took a year off uni and I went snowboarding in America and I actually broke my neck. And it was, um, it's a super epic story, which I won't share with you now. But basically, it was a pretty close call. Uh, at the time, I didn't even know. So I kept snowboarding on and off. I took some time off uni and literally went from America to Australia to America to Australia, snowboarding back to back. Um, with a fractured C2, right? So I finally came back. I told my mom about it. She's like, we should go to the doctor and check this out. Like, this doesn't sound very good. And it turned out I had a broken C2 and needed emergency surgery, which I went into the next day. And it was a close call. And I think having one of these sort of near death experiences puts another sort of uh, perspective on life. It's like, wow, that was a close call. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna waste any more of you know what's what's coming up i'm just going to do the best i can and make the most out of it so i think those two experiences played a massive role in in sort of like my, my behavior and um you know when things fail it's not the end of the world i just move on and things like that so i guess i guess like my final note would be on a positive note to just kind of remind photographers um that they should feel really privileged to be in this career um, or whatever career you're in. I guess like really think that like, being a photographer in our case, because we run Ninja, so most of the audience are photographers. 
but it's a like it's a really really awesome job like you know you get you get to be a part of other people's lives it's a positive experience you're out and about every day there's variety you've got interesting challenges it's quite lucrative if you do it correctly um you know i could I could literally think of a hundred other jobs that would be a million times worse um, than being a photographer. So I think it's sometimes it's nice to have a friendly reminder that you're a photographer. It's an awesome job. Like, yeah, just appreciate it. Like it's, it's um, have fun. Have fun. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. Just don't forget, like, don't look at all the negativity. Like think about all like this, there's so much positivity there in this amazing career that you guys have chosen uh, as the listeners. And um just yeah, just just appreciate and 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 realize um, how lucky you are to be in this career. You know, as as they say, enjoy enjoy the process, enjoy the the, the journey. Although you know, sometimes you, you you might wake up you're like, oh, I can't get through today. Um, but you know, I think it's really a good reminder to always just enjoy you know enjoy being in it, celebrate the small wins. Um, yeah. Love that. That's, yeah, that's that's where I'd like to end. Sally, thank you. <laughs> it's a good job. I'm a lot of questions then, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Chris, you and thank you so much for carving out your busy day to come and chat with me on NinjaCast. I really, really appreciate it. Hopefully I'm still here next month, guys. If if I am, then it's a good sign. <laughs> you did well, Sally. We're not gonna fire you just yet. <laughs> oh, I'm so lucky. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Sally. Amazing. Well, I will catch you guys very soon. Thank you again. And I'm sure our listeners have learned tons about Studio Ninja and your brand new book. Thanks, Sally. Thanks again. Thank you, you, Sally. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay, guys, that's everything from me today. Thank you so much again to Chris and to Ewan for coming and joining us on the show, telling us a little bit more about Studio Ninja and giving us those top tips to make sure your business is running smoothly. If you'd like to hear more, you can head to www.studioninja.co forward slash episode 58. As always, guys, please don't forget to rate us on the podcast platform that you're listening on. A little bit of love goes a very long way. I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of NinjaCast, brought to you by Studio Ninja. Beautifully designed and super easy to use, Studio Ninja will help you manage your leads, clients, shoots, invoices, contracts, workflows, and so much more. To learn more or start your 30-day free trial, go to www.studioninja.co.